I am actually going to transfer uh, a transition over and introduce our, our guest speaker for tonight. Uh, we have Dr. Noel Williams. Dr. Williams is the director of our program and uh, has been with Penn Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery since I believe its inception. Uh, so he is the director of the inner city hospitals for uh, the Hospital University of Pennsylvania and also uh, for the entire program, including Penn Presbyterian and Pennsylvania Hospital. And he is here tonight um, to help kick off a support group, virtual support group, and to uh, be able to uh, answer some questions for us. So I'm hoping that you brought some fantastic and interesting questions for him to be able to answer. Uh, so at this point, I'm actually going to um, transition over to Dr. Williams here. Yeah. There we go. Can hear? We can hear. Excellent. Can you hear me? So our first question for you tonight actually is, um, would you mind talking to us a little bit and telling us what Penn Medicine has been doing in the face of COVID? How are we <laughs> adjusting care? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this great uh, not a podcast, but certainly an information session of a different kind. And I appreciate you all being here this evening. And uh, just to uh, reiterate what Colleen has said, I have been involved with this program since 1998 and uh, have seen it grow into a very, very large uh, and robust program. And what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about answering that question. So as you all know, we kind of all got hit with COVID back in March. And in fact, Penn Medicine kind of shut things down about the 13th, between the 13th and the 17th of March. We did no surgeries again until early to mid-May. And what I'm going to do is to talk to you a little bit about how we kind of restarted our, our renaissance back into the program, getting it back to where it is, to its full 100% capacity, which we're at now. And I'm going to talk to you about a little, a few of the things that have changed. So uh, what I'm going to do is go through the process and tell you each aspect of how that is trained and obviously changed. And, and I obviously explain to you uh, first and foremost that safety is the first thing that we take very seriously of our patients, especially in light of the uh, pandemic. So the first thing we changed was we got rid of in-person information sessions. So typically within our system in the three hospitals that we mentioned and the outlying areas, we had on average eight to 10 information sessions a week where individuals like myself went to those, answered questions for potential patients in person. So obviously with the, with the pandemic, we have changed that and we now have an online Info information session on a YouTube channel, which if you are a patient and you inquire as to how you can have bariatric surgery in Penn Medicine, we send you the link, you watch the video. And it's been really welcomed and received with unanimous praise in terms of not just the content, but also the, the ease with which the patient can enter our program. The second phase, once you have watched that and want to see one of our surgeons in one of the three hospitals I mentioned or that Colleen mentioned in the city, you basically inquire as to an appointment. And the second thing we've done that's remained virtual is that you now have your first visit and in fact many subsequent visits virtually. So telehealth or telemedicine using a platform similar to Microsoft Teams called BlueJeans, we see patients. For example, I had clinic today, I saw many patients in my office remotely. Uh, like everything else, there are, there are advantages to doing this, obviously keeping you safe and not coming to a crowded area, but more importantly, we see patients uh, whilst they're in their homes or in their office, or if they want to step out of an office into a car sometimes and deal with the, the, the consultation that way. And also there's no commute. Patients don't have to come all the way to our hospital, they don't have to park, don't have to wait in a waiting room. So they're all advantages that we have seen and, and put in place. Many subsequent visits after that first visit, as you all know, is include seeing a dietitian, seeing a nurse practitioner and seeing my, myself where we go through the entire program and the plan going forward, as well as assessing patients overall health and suitability for the program. The second and third visits before surgery can also be done by telehealth. And then at one point or one visit, the patients come in to see us in the office 
Obviously, I meet them before surgery. We talk about the surgery again. We get a consent for the operation. And then if you if we fast forward to the surgery, one of the things I want to make very clear is that the safety of patients coming into the hospital. There is a very, very robust patient safety and employee safety program at our hospitals in the city. Everybody wears a mask. Social distancing is very important. And indeed, every morning before we enter the building as physicians and or providers or staff to the hospital, everybody has to be either tested with a temperature probe or now more recently, we have an app on our phones that you fill in for symptoms, et cetera, and it clears you before you go into the building. And in fact, if you look, if we look at the data of patients who come into the hospital and also workers who come to the hospital, the uh, pandemic really has not hit our staff nor our patients. There's there's been a very, very, very low number or percentage of patients and staff who get COVID in the hospital. In fact, it's 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 actually quite quite close to zero. So again, safety is really important. Every patient who comes to surgery, for example, I'm operating tomorrow, all those patients will have had COVID uh, tests within the last three days. So 72 hours prior to surgery, every patient is tested. Typically, depending on the operation the patient has, you stay between 24 and 48 hours in the hospital and then patients go home. And then the, the, the next cycle begins, meaning that the post-operative care also begins. And again, today in my office, I saw patients who were at the first and second visit post-op, and I still saw them over the telemedicine uh, situation. Now, some patients still like to come to the office and are welcome to do that. But obviously what we try to do is to see as many patients as we can. And the advantage of the telehealth is that I can see some patients that way and some patients in the office because we have to have social distancing in the office. And when you come into the hospital, you'll see signs everywhere saying, you know, masks on, social distancing, chairs and waiting rooms are very spread out. Typically what we try to do when patients actually come to the office is to get them straight into an, a consulting or an examining room as quickly as possible so there's no wait in the waiting area. So we found that very advantageous. And we have found that this has been this overall program that I'm describing to you has been very, very well received by both our staff and more importantly by all our patients. And the, the I, I think in the entire time that I've gone back and doing these operations since COVID or since the pandemic, we've only had, you know, I think only one patient that I can recollect that their their COVID test came up positive the day before they came to surgery. And obviously the patient the surgery was cancelled. They they uh, were somewhat asymptomatic, got a little bit sick, and then got better. And then over time, came back into the system, and we successfully carried out their surgery. All right, wonderful. Uh, that is an excellent synopsis, and we um, uh, are having fantastic conversation off in the uh, chat box. So thank you to to everyone that's. Um, uh, submitting questions. Um, so the first one we actually have from Daniel, he's having surgery on the 27th and asks if you have any specific tips for him as he gets into the, the final steps of surgery. So between now and then, what I would say is to keep active. Um, I'm sure that all the various instructions have been given in relation to dietary modifications before that, which we have a protocol, as you know, and um, just uh, keep, keep to those, keep active, keep moving. Can, what I try to tell patients before they come in to have surgery is rather than crawling after the surgery the day after, you want to be up and running. So you want to do some of the things that you're going to be carrying out and doing from a dietary standpoint, from an activity standpoint, get those done pre-op so that you're very comfortable with that so that when you come into the hospital, for example, the patients I'm operating on tomorrow, they will come in tomorrow more than likely we'll go home before or just after noon on Friday or mid afternoon and then get back into their normal routine at home. And then obviously they come back to see us either virtually or in person, as I previously mentioned uh, in the office. But, you know, the, the specifics of all the instructions that you've got, make sure you, you keep to those. Uh, if you've had your 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 penult your last visit prior to surgery, we give all the instructions. The beauty of that 
is that you see and meet with dietitians that will help you once more to get ready for the, the setting after surgery, and also meeting the nurses who will talk to you a bit about your inpatient experience. And, uh, you know, fortunately, you don't spend too long in hospital. So, you know, typically uh, we try to get patients very safely into and out of the hospital. All right, wonderful. And so I, I will add the caveat of um, if this is something that you would you would like additional um, dietitian comments on. I am here. We have a lot of food questions for you here, Dr. Williams. So um, we, we will start off with uh, I had surgery September 23rd. I know this probably sounds crazy, but sometimes I feel hungry. Is that normal or could that be psychological? I'll let Colleen answer that one. <laughs> So um, I will push myself here for the camera for you. So uh, that is that is completely normal. So the question ends up becoming, is this head hunger or is it physical hunger? And ultimately, those many times can be one and the same. So if somebody's having like grumbling, burning hunger sensations, that might be a sign of something else going on. I would recommend pick up the phone and call us. Don't guess, don't Google call us uh, or you can always my pen medicine message us as well to discuss and walk through what's going on that might be causing that because that might be something different than hunger if it's more of what we'd like to call like the seafood diet that if you see food you automatically have the urge to eat it and like you just feel like you're always looking at food and wanting to eat food um, at this point we consider that to be head hunger and that's a little bit different that's almost like an impulsivity um, and that's more more behavioral than anything else and isn't something that just automatically goes away it typically takes some some work uh, and that is something that we have many dietitians we have eight of them on staff to be able to help you walk through that uh, and figure out what's best for you so uh, ultimately to say that is very common many people experience that i'm so glad that you shared it um and uh pick up the phone give us a call and we'll walk through it but you're not alone in that feeling uh so i will shift back over to dr williams here uh, and go to the, the next one. Um, we have a few other food ones, but let's jump over to some uh, symptoms. So is it normal for someone to feel nauseous and dizzy a lot of the time after surgery? This is from Stephanie. Right, so you know, one of the things that we stress, and we, I spoke to, to the first question a couple of minutes ago, pre-op, is to get yourself into a habit of hydration and making sure you drink lots of liquids. And you know, sometimes, as you all know, when you have surgery, the actual amount of food and sometimes the amount of liquids that patients take in post-op can tends to be a little bit de decreased. Uh, so, from a from a kind of a feeling lightheaded or dizzy standpoint, it's essential to make sure you stay well hydrated. In addition to the the dietary side of things that our diet dietary staff will help you with. And again, nausea is somewhat intermittent or somewhat infrequent after a long time, but sometimes before, not before, but just after the surgery, this can be a bit of a problem, but typically writes itself within a week or two after the operation. All right, excellent. Um, and all of this to say as a caveat to uh, what Dr. Williams is mentioning here um, is if if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to pick up the phone and give us give us a call if you feel like something might not be normal. Everyone is different. Um, OK, so. Let's see here. Um, a, a lot of them are food questions, so we have um, I. I had a sleeve in July in the last few weeks. I've turned into a snacker, but it's not healthy food. Do you have any suggestions on how to change this, Dr. Williams? Well, I think and depending on, I don't know whether you've been back for, I guess if you had surgery in July, you probably had at least two, two visits and do another one. And I think that it goes back to the kind of the educational process that we have in the beginning to stick to the foods that you were, you were, you know, instructed and helped to understand which are best for you um, in terms of, you know, snacking with with unhealthy things or things that taste too good. Obviously, easier said than done, but these are the things that everybody needs to focus on to make sure that the journey continues to be a successful one. All right, 
Excellent. Uh, so. Oh, uh, here's from Danielle, and we want to uh, make sure that she's not feeling alone here. She said that she feels like the only one here who's had gastric bypass. Um, so Danielle, you are not alone. We are so happy that you joined us tonight. Um, you, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the US uh, and also many in the Philadelphia area who have had gastric bypass. Um, if I could comment on that just a little bit, you know, uh, the, the um, different operations have kind of been around, have come, have gone a little bit. Um, there are a lot of patients today are having sleeve gastrectomies. Uh, over my career so far, I've probably operated on in excess of 3,000 patients for gastric bypasses, close to 2,000 patients for sleeve gastrectomy. And it seems like it's more common to have a sleeve. And the reason for that is that I think it's a very good operation that works extremely well. Having said that, there are certain people who come in to see us who would for whatever reason prefer to have that operation and what i say to patients is if you're an, if you're a candidate for either operation that makes it a little bit more difficult to decide because both operations work extremely well and depending on different individual one operation might suit better for example if somebody comes in and they have a pretty significant history of reflux or gastroesophageal reflux disease some of those patients don't do well if they have a sleeve, so they would have a gastric bypass. So we are doing, certainly in the last year or so, I've been increasing the number of patients I'm doing, or I see who need and have a gastric bypass as opposed to a sleeve. Having said that, there are a certain population of patients on one extreme or one side who are no question in my mind should only have a sleeve gastrectomy. Patients in it with a higher BMI, higher risk factors, uh, those patients should have a, a sleeve, uh, which is a, a pretty, it's a very good operation, but it also has less complications. As you can see, when you come to see us in the information stage or the information session stage, um, they have let the patients who have a gastric bypass compared to a sleeve have you know, a few different or increased potential complications down the line. Having said that, they're, they're a small percentage. When I talk about patients having you know, an internal hernia or ulcers uh, after a gastric bypass, it's less than 5%. It's not 50% of patients. And so, you know, these are the things that we talk about. And it's a, it's kind of a, a uh, different, different, different suit colors, different, you know, strokes for different folks in relation to, to gen, uh, generalizing. So we cannot generalize which operation somebody should have. And that's why I do it on an individual one-to-one -one basis. We provide the information up front. You come in the day of, of the clinic, you meet with a, a dietitian and a nurse practitioner. We decide, uh, you know, based on the information we are getting from patients, which probably should be the best operation. And indeed, there are certain tests that sometimes we have to carry out to make sure the patient is getting the appropriate uh, procedure. Wonderful. Um, so I, I'm hearing a, a theme from you, though, Dr. Williams, from a lot of these answers. Uh, and also, I've, I've plugged this a little bit as well. We're having a lot of specific questions in the chat box. It sounds like many times it's very individualized and there isn't a blanket answer. It's picking up the phone and give us a call. Is that mm -hmm. many times what you end up uh, responding with? Yes, I think so, for sure. You know, I think that you, you mean in relation to uh, post-operative symptoms or beforehand? Uh, either um, at any point in time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think with the, you know, with the the, uh, the ease with which patients can now communicate with us, obviously most of our patients have, you know, my pen chart where they can look at their results, they can chat to us, they can send messages, which people in the office are always reading. In addition, obviously, if you if you call and leave a message, if you don't get to speak to one of the administrative assistants or the nursing line, we get back to you. So I think that the most important thing to, to realize here is that if patients have any doubt about either symptoms or doubt about questions as to diet, post-op, pre-op, the most, in, most efficient thing to do is to give us a call. And, you know, when we talk to patients about the potential of complications that are happening after an operation, which fortunately is not very common, you know, don't wait. Call either the hospital, the office, and if necessary, 911 
to get, you know, to come to see us in the hospital. So what we tend to do or what our residents and nurse practitioners tend to do if they get a call is, and if we're not really happy with what we're hearing on the phone, we say, okay, come into the emergency room or if it's during the office hours, come to the office and you'll be seen by somebody reassured for the most part. And, you know, if we need to get a scan or if we need to get an ultrasound or a swallow, you know, an x-ray, we can get that in, in the hospital. So you know, the most important thing is communication. And we are always here. As Colleen pointed out, we have a lot of dietitians within the three city hospitals. We have many surgeons and uh, we have many nurse practitioners. And we are fortunate to have many really excellent residents who help us both in the clinic and also in the inpatient care and the operating room. And I think in a few weeks, we're probably going to have a resident speak to this uh, audience in one of these sessions just to explain the role of a resident within the hospital. And by and large, as I say to, to all the um, uh, patients, is that, you know, we are very fortunate to have very, very bright and excellent young doctors who are here training and also learning and also, more importantly, helping to look after our patients and keep them safe. And the residents that we have within the system in the three city hospitals all rotate to the three different hospitals. So the other hospitals besides the university hospital do not have their own residency programs. They're all shared from the, the, uh, the three hospitals. Excellent, excellent. And um, to, to that point, Dr. Williams, we're getting a lot of questions about long term struggles, especially in during the pandemic of um, struggling with weight regain or not sure if plateauing out at this point is normal. Um, I, I would just also tag on for answering those questions of one weight regain is to an extent I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here for a second uh, but to, to add on to yours. Uh, weight regain is um, somewhat to be expected. Uh, it's how much and what do you do about it? Time and time again, the studies have shown getting back engaged in treatment, pinpointing what's causing the weight regain and seeing if you need any additional treatment beyond that. Uh, now, these are going to be a few plugs. So one of them may be getting back into intensive treatment with a dietitian. We'll be having dietitians on the schedule coming up to talk to you about that um, and how to tackle weight regain. It could be something from a behavioral standpoint, also having psychologists joining. And then lastly, um, uh, it could be looking at anti-obesity medications. So we actually have one of our partners um, who will be joining us to talk about when is it time to start looking at anti-obesity medications after surgery? So I'll ask you to put a pin in those things. We are all on the same wavelength that you're looking for that information and we'll be bringing that to you. But a question specifically for Dr. Williams, I'm going to shift over. We've had a few questions about when would you consider revising an actual surgery? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question, a difficult question. So typically we have an algorithm or a plan of patients who come back to see us. And I, I would I kind of preempt that by saying that when we meet new patients, we say to them, look, the most important thing that you can do is following up. So typically our patients, the, sur the surgeries I'm doing tomorrow, those patients will come back to see us in two weeks after surgery, six weeks, three months, six months, a year, and every six months thereafter. Don't stop coming back after that. So going forward, we're going to have all that done more than likely by telemedicine. So basically, it'll be very easy for you to log on, make an appointment, speak to a dietitian, speak to myself, speak to a nurse practitioner. And what we really tell people to do is you, if you see kind of a plateau or a slight regain beginning, do not get disillusioned by that. What you want to do is get back in touch with us and then we can kind of reinvigorate things, see if there's any areas that you're lapsing in and, and kind of, you know, reignite the fire to make sure this is, this is um, important to success. Now, if you fast forward to sometimes we have patients who have not seen us for five years, for example, or more, or 10 years after surgery. Because remember, you know, I've been doing this since 1998. So we've, you know, we've operated on well over six and a half, 7,000 people, just at the university hospital alone. So from that standpoint, we have a lot of patients who we look after. And what I suggest to the patients who come back to see us with this sort of a problem is we first 
kind of get them back into the system, meaning what we call medical weight management. We get them in, we just, you know, go over what they're eating again from a dietary standpoint. We make sure there's no anatomical changes. We get an x-ray of the stomach to make sure things haven't changed. You know, the pouch has got bigger or there's a narrowing problem or whatever. And once we've decided and found out there's no anatomical uh, issues, and once we've really tried hard from a psychological standpoint and also behavior modification and diet, many patients actually can continue and get back to where their weight was before, to where they, they, they kind of bottomed out before they crept back up. I have once had a patient who I think I had operated on in 2003, I didn't see for maybe 10 or 13 years, came back, they put on about 100 pounds from their lowest. And over the next six months without a surgical revision, we were able to get their weight back down another 50 to 70 pounds. So that's the kind of the goal. There are certain patients that we will and do have to operate on and, you know, in, in a revisional standpoint, but we don't go straight to re revisional surgery. I think it's important first to get back into our system, see the dietitian, see the, the, the nurse practitioner before doing a revised operation purely for weight regain. And the, as Colleen pointed out, we have a very robust parallel medical clinic uh, attached to our program with some very experienced GI physicians and endocrinologists who have an interest in obesity and obesity medicine and potentially drugs that can be given to, to augment the operation that patients already have had. So it's not something we take on lightly. Typically our revisional surgery uh, are as patients who, for example, have had a lap band in, there's kind of been an issue with the lap band, have taken the lap band out, they subsequently get a sleep gastrectomy. On occasion, some patients have a sleep gastrectomy and more for, you know, really bad GERD. If they develop really bad GERD, we have to convert those patients to gastric bypasses. So, you know, strict revisional operation for regain is not that common, but obviously patients who exhaust getting back into the program from a medical standpoint, we would then look at those from a standpoint of uh, carrying out a, a, um, a revisional operation. And then, you know, there are some me other methods, endoscopic me methods that we work with our colleagues, a little bit experimental right now, you know, narrowing your pouch or things like that. So these are things that futuristically could also increase. Excellent, thank you. And I will um, add one of your comments about um, uh, talking about for medical training and surgical training, something that you are very much involved in. Um, a, a patient had commented in the chat box asking, please, please, is it Dr. Goldshore? Um, so he will love to hear that. Thank you. Um, our, our residents are a fantastic part of our team and um, we we will actually be having Dr. Gershuni join us and talk about um, how does that actually work and how do they end up uh, caring for you. Um, but I will pass that along to him. He will be very happy to, to hear. Um, so I'm actually, um, if you don't mind, Dr. Williams, going to take this next question since sure. it's specifically pertaining to my research um, around weight loss prior to surgery. So we've had two questions come in about whether or not someone should be losing weight prior to surgery or how much weight they should lose prior to surgery. So uh, to, we don't technically require that someone lose weight prior to surgery. We encourage it. If someone is gaining weight before surgery, that may be a sign of something else going on that we might be worried about. Uh, but if someone loses weight prior to surgery, that starts their starting point a little bit further. So for example, if we expect you just throwing out numbers to lose about 100 pounds after surgery and you lose 10 pounds before surgery, we would expect you in total to lose 110 pounds. It just moves your starting point a little bit further. In terms of benefits for um, in the operating room or reducing risk, there are some studies suggesting that it might help a little bit, but what's really important is that two week diet prior to surgery. Uh, that's that's the main one. So it's not required to lose weight prior to surgery, but it is something that can give you a slight edge to lose more weight in total if that's something that you're looking for in, in treatment. Um, now with that, um, we are actually gonna shift over back to you, Dr. Williams for the last question of the night. 
Um, and I, uh, what is your favorite part of your job? You know, that's a very difficult question because I enjoy all aspects of my job, but you know, one of the most, um, I guess, fulfilling things or, or favorite part of my job is when I see patients in my office who are typically post-op and they've done tremendously well. They, they're, you know, their lives have changed, uh, not just the way they look, but the way they feel, the way their medical conditions have improved. And, you know, it's kind of, I'm a soft sort of guy. And, and I think if a patient wants to give you a hug to show their appreciation of how, you know, they have done, it's really very, a very moving um, experience. Um, I love patients from a very early stage of my career in training and in my surgical training, not just medical school. I found it very easy to relate to patients. And I think this is a very important uh, quality that a physician has, not just from a, a, a medical standpoint, but from a surgical standpoint. You, you need to be able to speak to a patient. You need to be able to assure them that you can keep them safe, assure them that you will look after them in, in good times and in bad times. So, you know, going to work every day, it is a busy job. It's uh, very fulfilling. Um, you know, looking after patients is why we're here. That is what our calling was to, to make patients better, to help them in any way, uh, shape or form. Um, and obviously we have with us residents, nurse practitioners, dietitians who, who are part of our team. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's teamwork. And somebody who's an individual who doesn't like working with other people, it's a difficult place to work because we are a team all the time. And it really is fulfilling every day. You know, today I was in clinic, it was a very busy clinic. Uh, yesterday I was in the operating room, tomorrow I'm in the operating room. So, you know, and then what many people don't see and realize, and I, I sometimes and oftentimes talk to our patients about this, the operating room is a very serious place. Having said that, the teamwork that's in there is, is first class. You know, we have the patient comes in, the nurse greets the patient at the door. Um, this is just before entering the actual operating room as opposed to the pre-op area. And then the, the surgical technologist is there, the anesthesiologist. And we're very fortunate at our, our, at our hospital at Penn that we have individuals who have been with us in our program in the silo of our program in the operating room for years. And they are incredibly committed to the care of our patients. So from that standpoint, it is, it is very fulfilling for me to see the professionalism that these um, fellow staff workers and physicians and nurse practitioners and, and um, you know, technicians and scrub nurses have in the operating room. And then the other thing is we have our own post-operative floor. Again, you know, this is something that has, we, we have really evolved over the years. When I first started doing this, patients went to different floors, but now they go to one floor. The nurses are incredibly um, skilled in the care of the obese patient. And, you know, it's something that we, we don't just leave to, to task, meaning that we have in services, we have lectures for our nurses in the floors on the outpatients, giving them updates on how to care for patients. So I think it's, it's, it's a great place to work, not just as an institution, but it's a great place to help our patients. And that's why, that's why it's fulfilling for me. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And thank you for joining us tonight.